You know, there, are, there are a few things that I enjoy in life more than a really good country and western song. And you know, I, I, I can't. It was and it's, it, it was not always thing. I, you know, we I, when I was in high school, I was like, I kind of made fun of it. And the older I got, the more I realized that they're just they're great songs, and you can make jokes about their content. You remember when I was a kid? I think the big famous joke was, "What do you get when you play a country song backwards?" I got my dog back. I got my truck back. I got my trailer back. You know, you know what I'm saying? But we can make jokes about their content. But you know, country western music is it, it's 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 pretty much arranged around the idea of dreams, of doubts, of despair. But above anything else, good country songs are about love. Now, this week I attempted. I thought I was going to make a, a list of my favorite country songs about love, but I realized that all I was actually doing was just creating the track list from George Jones' greatest hits. <laughs> Man, he stopped loving her to the I chills every time. Ugh. But so many of these songs, they're around the idea of of a love that's not answered, a love that's been broken, a love that one accepts or a love that one doesn't accept. Uh, But we're not here today to talk about country music. We could. I mean, I could talk about country music all day long. We're not here to talk about country music today. We're here to talk about love. We're going to talk about love as a fruit of the Spirit. We started this conversation last week about the fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit um, are visible examples of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. I'm just going to read to you those two verses from Galatians where we find the fruits of the Spirit. That's what Paul says. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. You know, the Holy Spirit, the, the, the Holy Spirit, and giving us these fruits, they change us because these fruits are not about what we have in us. These fruits are about what Jesus puts into us through the Holy Spirit. It's not about what it's on; it's in us. It's about what the Holy Spirit puts in us. Now, if it's just about what we have in us, I know uh, all week long I was struggling with this because I was like, you know, I really don't want to kind of talk about love. You know, as a guy, I'm like, I kind of, you know, love, okay. It's kind of mushy. It makes, good, it makes a great country song. There's that whole side of things. There's also the side of things, you know, sometimes I really have a hard time loving. Sometimes I might not necessarily, might not want to love. But I realize that so much of that is me thinking that love is an emotion that we have. And it's simply a way of us trying to describe a way that we've encountered and engaged with God. But it's fact, it's the exact opposite that uh, love is something that God gives us and our own uh, frustrations and our own worries and fears about engaging with love because the fact that we're not God. And we realize our inadequacy of trying to engage like God does. But we're gonna talk about that today. Uh, So 1 John 4, verse seven through 13, that's gonna be our passage for the day where we talk about love. And, and, And friends, this is possibly one of the most just, the best place to look at what does love mean in God, to, to God and in God's economy there is in scripture. So for 7 through 13, that's what it says. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending us his one and only son to the world so that we might have eternal life through him. And this is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. I'm gonna read read that again. But his love is brought to full expression in us. And God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. Love is, is complicated. But the first step for us understanding what love is, for us to think about that, the first thing is for us to realize that God's first action is love. Love is not something that he had to do for us. Love is not um, uh, something that he chose to do. Love is not something that he turns on or turns off. Love is not something that he chooses to give to some people and not to give to other people. But God's first action is love. In the Old Testament, when we begin seeing how God calls a people to himself and how God is engaging with people on earth, 
it's through love. All throughout the Old Testament, we read about God's loving kindness or his faithfulness. How God is loving the people that he comes into covenant with. And he, they use a, a kind of an ancient practice of covenant making to describe how God loves his people. And it's really interesting. Typically, you don't think about like a contract as a way to express love, right? Like usually we think of contracts or a way to, to, to keep ourselves safe, right? It's kind of a covering mode. But we see God expressing this relationship with his people through a covenant of loving kindness. And what's, what's weird is that covenants always assume a relationship might be broken one day. And that either party can pull out of this relationship at any time if someone has broken this process. But what we see is that God can break out of this, but God chooses to never have broken out of it. And when we have broken our relationship with God, It is not us who comes to do the fixing. It's God who comes to do the fixing for us. So God's love, the way that he reaches out, the way that he chooses to love us is radically different from the way that we would operate or we would behave in the first place. God is love. It's the first action. It's the primary action. God is love. You know, we often sometimes say that love is God, but us saying love is God is us just putting on our own like romantic idealism into the way that he interacts with us. I think for a lot of people who struggle with the idea of loving God, it's because we're implanting a human-centered romantic idealism on this relationship with him. Like, Jesus, you never brought me chocolate and flowers. I've got a sign, a, 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 it's actually like a, an old uh, like tablecloth that Meredith got me a few years ago. And it said, uh, my love language is biscuits and gravy, <laughs> which it is. But like, Jesus, you never brought me biscuits and gravy. Like, we, we get frustrated because we choose to interact that, that, that love is God. But no, that's not the case. God is love. And if we really think about it, they're fundamentally different. The beginning point of God's history, of God's relationship with us is love. It's not anger. It's not bitterness. It's not requirements. It's not judgment. It's love. God is love and God is loving. And he's taken this initiative with us first. The place that he's taken this primary initiative above anything else is Jesus Christ. He loved us so much that he came to fix what we had broken himself. And the only way that it could be fixed. And he chose to do that for us. And Jesus we see love defined in the act. And here's the thing, when we're having a hard time with love, when we're having a hard time with outward love, with what does it mean to love somebody, and we're gonna talk about that later on today. When we're having, a, when we're on the struggle bus, of what does it look like to apply love in our life? When we don't know what to do or what to think, what we can look at is how Jesus interacts. And how does Jesus interact in those situations in love where we would choose to interact in a very, very different way? The second thing that's important about love we see in this passage is this, and this is something that's so important to us. If you call yourself a Christian, if we're part of the local church, is this, that how we love is a visible example of our relationship towards God. If we want to know how much we have been impacted and have accepted and have chosen to follow in this world of Jesus, we need to simply look at how well do we love Our capacity to understand the love of God is directly related to our ability to give love. That how we treat others many times shows how we feel God has treated us. It's only kind of a tremendous personal example of just reflection. How we treat others oftentimes shows how we believe God has treated us. So that makes our understanding and our treatment of others it shows the level to which we've been willing to let Jesus come into our life and transform us. If we're holding back love, the first place that I feel like I have to look in my life when I'm holding back love is how much have I processed love? 
the, earlier this week, I was working on this sermon. I'm about to give away my hidden secret right now. And so I might have to find another hidden secret after this. But my favorite place, typically on Tuesdays, I take the whole day to work on sermons. And my favorite place to hide away from the world is the Washita Parish Library on North 18th. It is a different world when you walk into those doors. Like the internet's kind of there, but not really. Um, I forgot my noise canceling headphones on Tuesday, which you really need in the public library. And uh, it's like there's stuff's going on all around you. And I'm like, I'm like, be quiet. It's library. What, what happened? What happened to the library going shh? And also had like a string of errands, which I typically try to avoid on Tuesdays, but I had a string of errands all day long. And so like I was like having to go to as much, like as much traffic as we have in Monroe. I was having to go to those places at the exact wrong times all day long. And I realized just the irony of me researching and writing and praying through a sermon on love. And I had a day where I really did not want to love anyone around me. I said this before, like I, I, I hate air travel because I believe it's like the most, the, like the, the most sub-level of human existence because all we do is put our earbuds in and then pretend that nobody else around us matters at all. Like we try to be the guy that stands up immediately when the, the, the door is opened <laughs> so you can run out first and like dodge people and stuff. All Tuesday long is processing, man, how much do I love people? Because what I'm seeing in my own heart, in my own mind, as I'm doing this, <laughs> it's not loving. Like, where do I need to allow Jesus to come in and transform my heart? Because I realize I've got problems going on in my heart right now by the way that I want to treat those around me. See, we're sharing the truth of God and we're sharing the power of the love of God by how we manifest the love of God in this world. The way that we love speaks to who God is. And when we have a really hard time loving, what are we saying about the God that we claimed to have saved and redeemed and transformed us? Are we doing that good of a job? Or are we doing a kind of a cruddy job? We're making the presence of God a concrete reality by how we love. If we don't love and value, we are communicating that God does not love and value I want to say that again. If we don't love and value, we're communicating to people that God does not love and value. How we love tells the story of how we believe. And the last thing is this, that perfect love casts out all fear. It's a little bit further down in 1 John 4. I, I really wanted to read the whole chapter to y'all today, but Meredith said that was way too much. Uh, but this is what it says. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we're afraid, it's for fear of punishment. And this, this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. Such love has no fear. So what do we do about the people we don't like? Because that's really what this kind of comes down to. Like we love to love the people that we love, Right? We can't have a conversation with the love as the fruit of the Spirit, as the outward action of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life without talking about how do we love the people we don't like. This is perfect love casts out all fear. Perfect love. Perfect is the concept that we find in Christianity, in Scripture. Perfect. And perfect doesn't mean without blemish. We're humans. We can't live a life like that. It means to bring to completion, no, to, uh, to, to full measure. But this is what I love the most that we see this in Scripture. It means to overcome expecting limitations. Perfect love casts out all fear. Love that overcomes expected limitations. Friends, we live in a world that has completely told us it's all right to not like people, right? We live in a world to where, I mean, the polarization of our society right now it's completely culturally acceptable to hate other people now. We have all sorts of words to use to describe it. That scripture, perfect love, cast out all fear. We get into these situations because we become fearful. Because we become fearful that something about who I am or what I am or what I have is going to be threatened. St. Yoda said... Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to the dark side. 
Saint Yoda. I'm telling you, right? <laughs> There's going to be people because every single one of us has a different experience in life. Every single person has gone through something different than the person they're sitting next to. Even those of you who are married, you have different, different examples and different situations you've gone through in your life that your spouse might not have been through. If you have kids, you're probably doing everything you can to make sure your kids' experience in life is drastically different than the experience in life that you had, right? We all have had different experiences in life. Some of y'all have been at Foundry for a long time. Remember Allison Sauls when she was here? Uh, sometimes there was one day that I was, I was kind of frustrated with somebody. And Allison said this to me, and she said this to me, and it stuck with me ever since then. And she says, Chad, your world is very different than her world. And there's so much truth inside of that statement. Your world is different from her world. Some of us have big worlds. Some of us have medium-sized worlds. Some of us have worlds the size of Sterlington. All of us have had a different level of experiences that made us who we are. So when we talk about people we don't understand or we don't agree with or that we don't like, we have to talk about that in terms of love. Because we look at what does, is what does Jesus do? How does Jesus interact with these people? There's one thing that Jesus never did. And sadly, it's the first step that it's so easy for you and I to go to now in our world. But what Jesus never did was dehumanize. I mean, there's clearly people that Jesus did not agree with in Scripture. We see that. There's people that might not have understood who he was. His own disciples didn't figure it out. I'm sure there's some people he did not like as well. But what we see Christ exercise this love is never through actions of dehumanization. That love is about value. Love's about saying, I might not agree with you, or I might not understand you. And because of the love of Jesus, I can love you. The fruits of the Spirit are about outward actions. Outward actions matter when we need outward actions, right? Outward actions are simply just reactions. True love is only manifested by an action of the Spirit. That's the difference between human love and God's love. Human love has qualifications behind it, right? We can, we, can, we can say, I don't agree with them because of this, or I don't like them because of this, or I hate them because of this. Human love has boundaries around it. God's love is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit that in spite of every single thing that our sinful nature might be trying to say, it's us saying, I can love because Jesus loves it's us saying, I'm willing to be defined and powered by the love of God that's implanted upon my heart. It's us saying, it's me saying, it's you saying, I am going to allow the Holy Spirit to have such a presence in my life that it changes the way I outwardly behave. And friends, if we think about that, that is truly something radical, isn't it? 